Hello and welcome to today's presentation on the census and contributions within an employee benefit plan. I'm Pamela Orlowski. I'm an audit manager here at Sigich specialized in employee benefit plans. We have lots of specialized team members, but I'd also like to introduce Karen Sanchez. She's the partner in charge of our employee benefit plan services. Please feel free to reach out to either one of us after the presentation if you have any questions. Today, we're going to talk about what the census file is and what it represents and how your plan uses it for both the audit and for plan administration. We'll go over some guidance as to how to create and reconcile your census file. And we'll also talk about plan contributions and the importance of timely reconciled remittances. So first, what is a census file? Your census file is a listing of all employees that were paid during the year. They should be included even if they weren't participating in the plan. Both the auditor and your service provider, most likely your third party administrator, um, will be using this census file and they need to consider these non participating employees. And even if the plan isn't subject to an audit, it's used for the annual compliance testing that's performed by that service provider, and these non participants are factored into those tests. So creating your census file could be a little bit different depending on who your service provider is and the nature of your plan. So your service provider will give you a required format. So we recommend reaching out to either again this third party administrator or whoever is running that compliance testing for you. Um, and they'll give you the required fields that they need. They'll give you the required formatting, which is usually an Excel or a CSV document. And it's critical to follow their format requirements because they are likely uploading that document into an internal system. So generally in January, you will receive some sort of communication from the TPA or service provider with instructions on preparing the census. And often there's a compliance questionnaire you'll need to fill out in conjunction with this. In some rare cases, the provider may not require you to prepare a census file. So this could happen if your payroll system is fully integrated into the record keeping system and they already have access to everything that they need. However, these requirements could change at any time. So be sure to check in each year with your contact. Um, and also, if your plan is subject to an annual audit, the auditors will ask you for a census file. Often the easiest way to start your census file is from your payroll system. There could be a standard or custom report that you could run that gives you all of the initial information. And then ideally, you can copy it into the required format from the service provider. So some common fields that we've included here are related to basic demographic information. Um, you know, so obviously some sort of employee identifier with their name in case you have people with duplicate, you know, names. Um, they'll want, you know, date of birth, date of hire, date of termination, potentially maybe asking for a rehire date. Um, compensation will be necessary. And then the different types of deferrals that are in place. So pre-tax and Roth, it could be broken out additionally by catch-up contributions. And then there will be fields for whatever types of employer contributions you have. Um, if there's a standard match that happens with payroll, you know, as well as a profit sharing contribution at the end of the year, uh, they'll want all of that information. And usually they like to see loan repayments. There are also some less common fields that you'll see, particularly from the auditor. These are less common, but they could be necessary for your compliance testing. So these more focus on, you know, eligibility, um, you know, specific date of eligibility, you know, maybe a yes or no field to identify if the employee is eligible for the plan, identification of those highly compensated employees or owners, uh, location and division is helpful for both the compliance testing purposes and for the auditors. Um, again, eligible compensation, um, 
types and amounts of various types of ineligible compensation, such as maybe bonuses, and then a job classification. So if your plan maybe excludes part-time or seasonal employees, or they have a separate service requirement for part-time or seasonal employees or interns to become eligible, that job classification can be very helpful. So once the census file is prepared, you want to reconcile that file. So first you're going to reconcile to payroll. Now again, you may have started with a payroll report, some sort of system download so that you can do that copy and paste. But so what you'll want to do is generate your year to date payroll report from the payroll system. So this is likely gonna be in a PDF format. Um, for example, if it's ADP, it's that ADP master control. It should not just be the final payroll register because that won't capture terminated employees or employees who weren't paid on that particular pay date. You want, you want everybody who was paid during the year. Um, and you want to ensure that this report includes any off-cycle payrolls um, or manual payrolls. So if those are run and they aren't part of this, this master control report or this you know, year to date report, you might have to run a few additional reports to make sure you have all of your payroll information for the year. Then you'll want to look at your monetary fields like gross compensation, your pre-tax or Roth deferrals match. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that these system generated PDF reports, these control reports, that those totals agree to the totals that you have in your census file now. And that will ensure that you captured everything on your census file and that it's complete from the payroll system. So once you feel comfortable that you have everything from the payroll side, you want to reconcile then to the trust. So that could be, who, that's whoever is holding your assets. So it could be Fidelity, Empower, John Hancock, so you'll want to run a report of contributions from that trust system or custodial system for the year. So this could be a different process for each service provider and they can assist you if needed if you're not familiar with their report functions. But what you wanna make sure when you run that report is that you've captured all of the payroll dates during the year. So you want to watch for nuances such as, you know, Fidelity doesn't track the payroll date in their contributions report. It's purely by remittance date. So you may need to modify your date range to capture all of the relevant payrolls. So, for example, if that report is by remittance date and that last payroll of 2023 was not remitted until 2024, and your plan year ends 12 31 2023 you're going to want to expand that report date out a little bit into january 2024 so you know our example here is showing that 12 30 2023 payroll was actually remitted to the plan on january 2nd 2024 so that's what's called your current year receivable for the 2023 plan year and then we've also shown an example of what a prior year receivable could look like. So that last payroll of 2022 was actually remitted in 2023. So receivables and benefit plans can be a little bit confusing because this is different than your standard payroll receivable for accounting. So for benefit plans, we are looking at that last payroll date of the year and when that was remitted to the plan. So it may not be that clean cutoff of the very last day of the year. Whereas in your standard accounting, your receivable is related to the actual calendar days that the pay period covers if it crosses over between years. So you could have a pay period covering, you know, December 26th to January 4th, and your receivable you know, is going to break out between that period. So benefit plans are a lot easier because you just want to focus on that final pay date of the plan year. Even if some of the actual days worked are in the plan year, if it wasn't paid till the following, it's not part of what we're trying to capture. And again, reconciling both your census 
and to your trust are important because it's ensuring that that census file is complete and that you didn't miss any remittances during the year. You know, if you look at all of your payroll data and your payroll data is higher than what you're seeing in the trust, you could have missed a remittance. So you'll want to look into that, resolve it, correct it as needed prior to submitting that census file for compliance testing. So what we have here on this slide is a very high level example of a census file and how you can perform that reconciliation. Um, just for sake of size, we didn't include all of the potential fields. Uh, but one thing I do really want to point out here is this example employee A. So this person had compensation during the year, but happened to be a union employee and not eligible for this plan. But you see, we still put the person in here. We made sure that our total per our census on these monetary fields agreed to both of our payroll and our trust reporting. Now we're going to shift more into the timeliness and accuracy of contribution remittances. The Department of Labor has very specific guidelines about what they consider a timely remittance. So they say it is the earliest date that the contributions can be segregated from general assets, but no later than the 15th business day of the month following the month in which the contribution is withheld. So to put that in plain language, you need to remit these contributions as soon as administratively feasible. You can't hold them. You, you can't assume that just because you made it within that 15th day of the following month that it wouldn't be considered late. We'll talk in the, a bit coming up about what patterns and items that they look for. Um, but if something is identified as late, a payroll remittance is identified as late, this is what's called an operational error and a prohibited transaction. So it ends up getting reported both on the Schedule H of the Form 5500 and on the annual audit report. So to circle back to what the Department of Labor may consider late or what they consider a reasonable time period. So say you remit your payroll contributions to the trust generally three days after the payroll date. And this is your consistent process throughout the year. But you had a couple payroll remittances that went in six or seven days after the pay date versus that three. Those could be considered late by both the auditor and the Department of Labor because you're outside of that pattern of three days. You've proven that you can do it within three days. So you would need to explain why was it not administratively feasible for me to remit those contributions in the three days? And there could be valid reasons for that, but it's good to, to look at these items and look at these on a per pay period basis so that you can explain, identify any problems that may come up very timely. So we recommend reconciling between payroll and the trust and looking at that number of days each pay period. So for example, after you've remitted that payroll, ensure you've saved or uh, we're mostly a paperless world now, but perhaps printed a copy of that payroll register that you remit your contributions, which through whatever process, you know, is required by that service provider. And then you can usually obtain a remittance confirmation or some other form of support once those contributions are posted to those participant accounts. So you re and you do wanna make sure that they actually posted to the accounts. That's a separate check that you'll want to do because just because you remitted it, you need to make sure that service provider actually allocated those, those contributions to the participants. So there's all different reports you can run um, to, to try to check all of this. Again, it all depends on your provider. And there, there could be valid reasons why a fund didn't post. So maybe the participant already met the maximum amount, amount of allowable deferrals for the year. They reached, you know, whatever that annual maximum is. 
And maybe your payroll system didn't catch that and still put those contributions in through payroll. But maybe the service provider catches it and says, well, we're not going to post these to the participant account because they've already reached their maximum. You'll then see that maybe your final remittance and what posted didn't agree to what happened in payroll and you can look into it quickly and either correct that or just document that that was the reason for the difference. Um, you could also identify if there's an update in the system that needs to be made. So maybe you have a new participating employee within payroll, but they weren't ever set up in the service provider system. So that person's contributions could get rejected in that posting process. So then again, if you check, you can make sure that participant gets set up. Everything will still get posted timely and you could make that note that maybe that person's contributions were a day or two later than everyone else's because there needed to be time to get the person set up. And then you might actually find a real problem, which is that you missed remitting data. Um, such as that one of those off cycle or manual checks. So you can, again, hopefully quickly get those funds remitted and then that would still be considered a timely remittance. So what we have here on this slide, and I know it's a lot of information and a little bit hard to see, but we did provide you with a handout of, of a, essentially a blank version of this contribution timeliness template that you can use throughout the year. So what you would do is each payroll, you would enter that payroll date. And then once you verify it posted, you know, you could put in that date received by the plan. And then that days to remit column will manual or will automatically it's formulated for you. It will automatically calculate that number of days. And it accounts for things like holidays and weekends because the rule is business days. So this will truly calculate it on business days. And then with each column, again, when you put in your payroll date, you have your payroll done. You can put in your amounts by source, whatever those may be. And then when you look at the trust reporting after everything posts, you make sure that those amounts agree. And if there's a difference, you can easily document it here and you know what happened. If you need to explain it later, or again, if you miss something, you could make notes and get it corrected timely. It is always easier to make any notes or corrections when you identify these in real time, rather than having to do so at a later date when you might not really remember the issue. You could have changes in payroll people, maybe something wasn't downloaded property, properly and the records weren't kept, and you just won't be able to remember what happened. So if we look at, for example, the one that is identified here, deposit number four is nine days late. Here we noted somebody missed remitting this payroll. So you need to work with your service provider or third party administrator to remit those contributions and potentially calculate lost earnings depending on how late it is and what process you're going to choose. But then if we look at a deposit that maybe doesn't reconcile, that loan payment here you can see doesn't reconcile at number eight. Well, this was that the participant paid off the loan in full outside of the payroll system. So they were making normal payments through payroll and decided to pay off their loan early. So they worked directly with the service provider and made a final payment. And that's an acceptable difference between payroll and the trust. But here you can see why the trust is higher. And then here we have an example of what would be considered a delay, the six days at remittance number 12, deposit number 12, is outside of your normal range of days. However, there's a note here that there, there was some sort of error in the upload process. Things didn't upload properly. You had to redo something. So that is still considered administratively feasible. You are working through an issue, and here you'd have clean documentation to say, you know, this is what happened, and this is why this one is a little bit different than others. So this is not required, um, but we have found that clients that do this, it's very helpful. They catch their errors in advance. 
Um, they are easily able to explain when the auditors come asking questions at the end of the year, uh, why certain things, you know, were outside of a normal range or what happened here, you know, why doesn't this reconcile? So again, within your handouts, we'll have this template for you. Another template that we'll provide for you is this overall uh, annual uh, reconciliation that you can do. So the benefit of this particular template is that you can see something like a receivable. So you could, you know, in our previous slide, there were no receivables. You were just filling that out with each payroll date and you were just looking at the trust reporting for that particular payroll date. Whereas in this example, you're doing this based on year to date totals. So here, these contributions for the trust report did not necessarily agree to your total contributions per payroll. And then you're able to identify, oh, you know what? I see that that last payroll of 2022 posted during 2023. I have to back that out of my reconciliation. So once that's backed out, your total contributions on the accrual basis there, those agree to the previous slide now. And then we have our payroll numbers that agreed to the previous slide. And we can see we had that small difference. And you had already identified what that was and explained it in that timeliness of contributions reconciliation that you were doing each pay period. So you knew what it was and you didn't have to look any, at anything further. Um, and again, this will also help you capture if you missed it in you know, the pay period by pay period. Did you miss remitting a payroll? Did you miss an off cycle check, a manual check, anything like that? So thank you everyone for joining this presentation today and listening with us. We hope you found it informative. Let us know if you have any questions after watching this or if you have any other requested topics you'd like to see for upcoming webinars. Thank you.